please note that this video contains spoilers. The Blues Brothers movie thoughts. I suppose I'll just start with the beginning. The the penguin. The whole sequence leading up to meeting the penguin. In, in fact, just introductions in this movie are sometimes really good. You know, the introduction to Jake with all this build-up, you don't get to see his face. You don't see him properly until he's in uniform, until he's in the Blues Brothers uniform. You know, he needs to be wearing that black suit, the black tie, the white shirt, the black hat, and the sunglasses. You know, other than, the other, before that, it's, it's, ah, it's not completely Jake. It's not Jake. You know, Jake, Joliet Jake, not just yet, you know, when the doors open and he's changed into, you know, the clothes, that were essentially everything he brought into there other than, you know, the soiled prophylactic, that's when he is, you know, Joliet Jake. Now, the penguin, you know, the... As, as they enter, you know, the door opens with, without any kind of, you know, we don't see what is opening the door, and it doesn't appear to be a person, you know. It's, the, the whole sequence has a very supernatural quality to it, very, you know, intentionally. So, and you can really tell that John Landis also directed horror, you know. Maybe mostly horror comedy, but still horror. You know, he could scare you. And, you know, they they go through the door, they go up the stairs, and, and just the, the angle on it, you know, from down down and up, it it's like it's a great climb. It's it's uh you know, they're not just going up the stairs, they're going to their judgment, you know. And they're like a good bit up the stairs, maybe halfway up the stairs, and they look at Jesus in torment on the cross. We get a close-up of Jesus' tormented face in agony, and the door slams shut, you know, and it's just telling us there's no way back. There's only one way, and that's forward, you know, they have to face this. And they go up, and they're about, to, you know, Elwood is about to knock on the door. Of course it's not going to be Jake, you know. He still doesn't want to be there. Elwood's finger does not touch the door. And the penguin shouts from within. You know, and they, you know, and again, the door opens. We can't tell who's doing it, or what is doing it, or whatever, you know. And they enter, and then we get, you know, some more just straight kind of comedy that is maybe less farcical and more easy to take seriously. You know, we have them, they sit down in the chairs, no, no, come come closer, you know, and eh, they're not going to get up out of the chairs, so just drag them closer, you know. And the whole sequence with her smacking them over and over because they keep swearing, you know, it's just, it's a kind of good commentary on you know, if you hit someone for swearing, are they going to be less likely to swear again, or are they going to swear an immediate response to that? It is kind of self-defeating, and, you know, and she never actually just stops, you know, that's, it's the same, like, it's the same with the police, you know, it, it's very kind of, you know, on the subject of authority. John Landis really wants you to think about if, you know, if we should just try to force our will through or if we should maybe sometimes just stop and think, is, is this really the best course of action? You know, I might have the power to do this. I can do this, but should I? Just because I can, just because I maybe think that I'm, I'm an authority and I should be respected, you know. She, she wants to be respected so they shouldn't swear in front of her and the police want to be respected or you know, they, they want to catch them, you know. The, even, even the first time, the, you know, the police encounter. Actually, let me just briefly finish off the penguin. That sounded a lot less dirty in my head. The, 
you know, she, you know, they, they, Jake goes tumbling down the stairs because he's too fat to get out of the chair, you know, and he lands and she's in the doorway. Not sure we even see her approach though. She's just, she's in the doorway. And at first she's got this long ruler or whipping rod or what exactly. I, I love that it swishes when she, you know, moves it through the air. Poor Jake, he's the only one getting slapped with it because Elwood was quick enough to get, well then again, Elwood was the one who the regular ruler was broken over. And notice that she's got the ruler in her hand, even as she just, she gets up from the table and moves towards them. And she's got the ruler in her hand, you know, she's ready to hit, in case, yeah. You know, she's standing there in the doorway. I don't know where that, you know, whipping rod or whatever goes when she puts her hands together, but it just, it disappears, you know. And it's, it's big words, you know, it's not just, you know, it's not just some line, it's a speech, it's a monologue, it is a monologue of biblical proportions, you know. Get out and don't come back until you've redeemed yourselves. And, you know, you hear the, the wind and she gradually floats back into the room and the door closes again without any kind of human assistance, you know. And, the, the, you know, then we have the, the light inspiring Jake to put the band back together, you know. And if James Brown were a Southern, a, a Southern Baptist preacher, I might have to go to church at least once. Now, the police, even in that first scene, okay, they call one car for backup, and they just chase Elwood around, you know. And when he drives into a mall, they don't stop and say, okay, we have to make sure that they can't get out the other side of that mall or something. They drive in after him. They cause about as much collateral damage as the Blues Brothers do. You know, they're as dangerous to their surroundings. Well, not quite as dangerous. I, I like the running gag of pretty much every time the Blues Brothers leave somewhere, there's going to be an explosion or some kind of, you know, when they're done in a place, when they no longer need a place to live because they're going to be on the road, you know, the house blows up, you know. Thanks, Carrie Fisher. We, you know, it just, yeah, that, that kind of nicely illustrated that they, they kind of are bad news, you know. I don't know when I turned Bostonian. It... But, but yeah, you know, the police should have handled that completely differently, obviously, you know. But they want their guy, they're, they're just, their pride was hurt. You know, they, they didn't prevent him from driving off and he drove off. What is, you know, what, what's, what's up with that? That, you don't do that. So they drive in after him and, you know, and the whole police situation just escalates until finally we have, we've got SWAT, we've got the military, got choppers, we've got snipers, we've got a tank, we've got jeeps, we've got firefighters for some reason, you know, all just rushing into this uh, municipal building, I guess, and just that, you know, climactic shot of just, you know, everyone aiming at, you know, the Blues Brothers, and they just exactly receive their receipt, and then you know, their hands are handcuffed together. And that just, it's perfect because at the most, you need maybe one of those people there pointing a gun at the, you know, maybe one per person, you know, maybe two people in that room pointing a gun at each of them. Especially once the handcuffs are on, you know, it's, they're, they're not even dangerous. They haven't hurt anyone at all. You know, we don't even see them brandishing a gun at any point. The closer they come to that is, you know, Scrumps and vehicles and such, and you know, maybe their car is a bit of a weapon, but just gotta love the demise of the car. You know, they just get out after all that driving, you know, it held up so well. And then finally, it just can't, it's, it's just a car. It's only, I don't know, car. Ein. Anyway, it's, you know, 
it can only take so much punishment. So they get out, rush off, and it just collapses. You know, it doesn't just break, it collapses completely. You know, and this is like one of the only times Elwood actually takes his hat off. You know, it's like, it, 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 it perished. And, and we cut to the two statues, you know, we have, I don't know the names of them, I'm not an art person, but, you know, they're just, and, and they're like, looking sad, you know, it's like, and it, it's just, well, that was too bad, you know, it, it just, yeah, love this movie. The Nazis, the Illinois Nazis, you know, just the, the whole, it's like with the cops, actually. It's the pride, you know. They're run off a bridge and they jump into the water. If they hadn't been standing, you know, I would wager that if they hadn't been so stubborn and stood their ground, you know, they were like, they were playing chicken with a car. And if you're not in a car, you shouldn't play chicken with a car. Logic, you know. If they hadn't been so freaking stubborn, if they had just gotten out of the way, or at least if they had run off, they might not have had to jump into the water, but they had to, you know, wait for that long, and then, you know, eventually they get basically forced into the water. Or maybe they would all wound up in the water, but anyway, you know, it also really says something about this type of people, that they're that stubborn, they're that proud, you know. But, it's, you know, they basically say, you know, we're gonna kill that son of a bitch. He just forced you into the water, you know, it's not like you're drowning, nothing happened, dude, just chill. Is that water not cold enough? But that's really, you know, that's that type of person. And it just, it, and, and Henry Gibson is just spot on. And I love that he, he has that same kind of, I don't want to say that he looks like Hitler, but I'm not saying that he doesn't. You know, he, he has a little bit of that same kind of thing, that stiffness and kind of a little bit small and just really frustrated looking fella. You know, it's, nothing against the per. I love him as an actor. He's really great. And Charles Napier as Tucker Carlson, I believe the name is, you know, um, lead singer and driver of the Winnebago, you know, for the good old boys. Just his delivery and the, the, the grin on him and just his voice and the whole thing and the accent. It's just all just perfect for that kind of type. You know, again, yeah, they're kind of making fun of it, but at the same time, it doesn't come across, at least to me, as if they really, like, hate this kind of thing. You know, he's a cowboy, and they have some fun with that. But it's not like, you know, saying we should all, you know, hate cowboys. The only hatred, I would say, is toward the Nazis. And I kind of side with that. I can see why, you know, there's, there, there are reasons to hate the Nazis. You know, it's not, and we're not even, like, talking about, you know, Germans in World War II. Because not all of them were Nazis, and certainly not all of them believed in that kind of ideology. But if you are a Nazi, if you if you aren't forced into it, and you believe that this is what, then yeah, I can kind of see hating that person or group. Now, the poetic justice, the irony of the demise of the two cars. You know, one of them digs a hole and the other one goes right into it. Like digging a grave for yourself or for one of your, you know, someone of your group. And one of the best lines of the entire movie. I've always loved you. Just perfect. Just, and, and, and Henry Gibson's face right there is just priceless. You know, it's just, it's, it's, if it hadn't been made in the 80s, but I guess in the somewhere in the 90s, it would have been a MasterCard commercial. Now, love Aretha Franklin's whole role, you know, the, just her reactions to the, you know, the food orders, just, 
and the yeah you know, the way she goes in and describes them just such black attitude and I can't do it justice so I'm not gonna impersonate it just the whole bit when she talks to Matt and Guitar Murphy and the reaction of both Matt and Lou you know just perfect Ray Charles selling the piano and just yeah you know, excuse me excuse me I I don't think there's anything wrong with the action on this piano and place shake your tail feather just love it you know never get tired of that everybody needs somebody to yeah just that might be the best song in the entire movie at least to me it's just it just really hits the nail on the head you know it just who can't agree with that who can't agree with the message of that song it's just yeah it's, it's just right there and you know and you can kind of enjoy maybe on an ironic kind of level the country western song in you know Bob's Country Bunker where they play, play both kinds both country and western and just love her just, just her, her the movement of her head you know and her the, the pitch of her voice and the dialect and they were just spot on you know, it's it's not too too much. It's not like you know trying too hard. It's just it it really it's just spot on. You know the I don't know what the, I don't know the title of the song, but that whole thing about you know sometimes it's hard to be a woman and you're know, staying by your man and that whole thing and just the reactions you know the couples enjoying it and then you have that one guy the single guy who's just he, he he's just sitting there crying a little bit and he just needs to drink some you know and that's and that right there also just really captures the essence of country western you know. I don't have a problem with the music genre, but it kind of is for people who are unhappy with something in their lives, maybe a lot of their lives, sit, listen to that music, drink, and cry. And, you know, if that's what you want to do, if that's maybe all you feel you can do, then, you know, that's, that's the music genre for you. I don't know because I don't know that much about Illinois, but it seems like they captured the music genres popular in the basic area and the kind of environments, the social environments, or the, the, the lower social environments especially, you know, with, you know, you've got the Southern Baptist Gospel Church. You've got the Soul Food Cafe with John Lee Hooker as a excuse me street musician out front. You know, if I believed that I might come across John Lee Hooker, I might scour the streets of Illinois. You know, and the you know the the country western bar and you know, and just you gotta love the you know well you. Know, here you you earn two hundred, and you drink beer for three. Yeah, that two hundred for playing several. We we never actually do find out what delays the good old boys so much. I mean, they, they, clearly they realize that they're late. You know, he they just you know Tucker just remarks that he's they're running very late. You know and. And that's kind of it, you know. I enjoyed the scene of uh, Maury, Maury Slime, with the whole, you know, you've got the kind of Jewish stereotype of, you know, kind of music agent kind of, you know, thing. And that whole conversation is just enjoyable and you know then at the end you realize that the entire band was sitting there listening and none of them said a word and you know they've got the sunglasses and the whole yeah just yeah the 
Carrie Fisher. I quite like just, you know, at first you don't know really what's going on. You know, it's just she keeps showing up, and every time she does, she has military grade hardware to try to kill them. You know, it's actually kind of the last thing she attacks them with is the least destructive thing she's brought into it. So, you know, she starts out using, you know, rocket launcher, dynam I don't know, dynamite, you know, some kind of explosive. I love that she times it perfectly. I don't know if she intends to, but to when the cops break in, you know, she uses a flamethrower. And then finally, just, you know, this submachine gun. Or an assault rifle. Apologies. The just the the idea of this scorned lover, you know, when she starts to explain, when she begins explaining what what her motivation is, you just kind of go, oh, yeah, of course, because there's got to be a ton of those. There's got to be a ton of women that the two of them abandon at some point, you know, because they're not trustworthy. They're not really the type. You know, but at the same time, they are charming, you know, and after that whole thing, you know, and, and just the, the, the reactions, the little details, the, the richness of detail is something I love about this film. Jake moves towards her and, you know, starts to, you know, try to convince her and, yeah, at first you think he's going to have, like, a good speech prepared or something really slick because he's been slick. They've both been so slick. But, he's just gonna beg. He's gonna beg for his life. And, you know, he comes up with these increasingly ridiculous excuses. Some of which actually kind of cancel each other out, as a friend of mine once pointed out. And, he kind of has to check, you know, he, he looks up, is she buying this? And, you see Elwood kind of going, oh, she's going to shoot again. And he, he covers, you know, it's just, just gotta love that. Just the tiniest little thing. You don't have to make a big deal out of something like that. It's just the little, the, the one shot of him, you know, covering again. And Carrie plays it beautifully. She is ice cold when she needs to be. But when she falls for Jake again, you believe it. You know, you're, you're thinking, ah, oh, yeah. And, Big kiss, and he just, you know, down with her, you know, we've got somewhere to be, so, and, and Elwood just passes her, and it's just, take it easy, you know, it's just kind of, what, what do you say to someone, what do, you, what do you say in that situation, what do you say to someone like that, and, you know, she gets up and fires at them, and they're long gone, of course, and the police fire at them, even though they're long gone, you know, like, later after, in, in, during the massive car chase, where a bunch of cars just hit each other in downtown, and the cops get out and all start firing their pistols at them, as if that's somehow going to, you know, and again, it's that, you know, proper application of force, you know, you might want to look into it, guys, it, it's, yeah, and, and just those two, the, I don't know, if you know, the main cops, kind of, you know, other than John Candy, who was priceless, the, the, the stupid grin on his face and just the, you know, the old wave to the Blues Brothers and the, you know, indication and the whole, yeah, just, anyway, the two cops, you know, you've got the African-American one and the, you know, the white one and just their faces, you know, they're, they're just, they epitomize this kind of angry cop who just wants you know, you, you don't want to mess with that cop, you know. Uh, I also truly love the scene at the restaurant, the upper class restaurant, just right from, you know, when they enter and, you know, Mr. Fabulous accidentally asks the possible patron on the phone if he didn't get put away for three years. You know, I also just love the conversation on the phone. Yes, 
we do have separate dining rooms, you know, because, I mean, one thing is, you know, it, it might be a fancy restaurant and the people there are all well-behaved, upper-class, respectable people, respectable members of the community, but really, you just, you might still want just, well, to eat a little bit away from them, you know, you don't want to get too crowded, you know. Elwood, standing, at, at first, he tries to jimmy open this glass case and see if he can swipe something from inside. You know, that's, just, that's like his first instinct. He enters somewhere fancy and he's like, hey, I might be able to steal this. Ah, okay, I can't. Anyway, and he just, he looks through the window at the people eating and everyone just stops and stares at him. And he's just standing there looking through the window and it's just like this it's it's like a peasant you know standing outside the palace and you know the the aristocracy just don't know what to do with him you know how what is he doing there doesn't he know that he doesn't belong here and just it's it's priceless and all these things you know they get increasingly obnoxious but some of the first things they do it's just hilarious to see that these things actually bother these rich people so much when they're really not doing much of anything. You know, they're clanging their glasses together like, you know, children, essentially. And, you know, they're sipping the, the very, you know, slurping, essentially, I guess, very loudly the $120 Dom Perignon, you know, that'll be fine, pal, whatever, you just sort, you know, you, yeah, just serve whatever, I just need something to drink, you know, and it just, it, th these rich people can't stand it, I love the, the daughters, as well as the wife of the rich mustached customer, you know, just the, you know, the daughters, both the youngest one and the slightly older one, the, the teenage one, they can't help but smile. They find it funny. They don't know if they're allowed to laugh. You know, the, the, the little girl actually has some really convincing reactions. They just, you know, because, and at the end of the day, you know, it isn't natural to be that freaking polite and that restrained, you know. You just, you want to get some of that energy out, you know. And really, and it's just, the man cannot handle it, the, the mustache man, and his wife, just the, the, her eyes, you know, she is just so extremely, hilariously embarrassed by the mere presence of these two louts, you know, what are they doing here, they don't, they don't belong, and the, the way Mr. Mustache has to spell it out, you know, it's, Frankly, it's their smell. They smell bad, you know, just so much fun. And, you know, obviously, you know, they threaten, we're going to eat here, you know, three meals a day, every day, just, you know, no matter what, if you don't quit and follow us. They can't afford that, obviously, you know, but... For the sake of the movie, you can kind of ignore that. Other little details that you just gotta love. The, you know, during uh, Everybody Needs Somebody to Love song, just, you know, <laughs> Charles Napier indicating you. You know, as he's standing there with... At first I thought it was like maybe baseball clubs. My father pointed out to me they are like the hand, the, the, the wooden part of an axe, like they, they just removed the metal part, the, the sharp part of an axe, and it's just, you know, so it's wood, it's gonna give you one heck of a beating, and they're standing there with these, and he's just, Ew, and he's just furious, you know, the man is, you know, if looks could kill, man, and just, and, you know, then afterwards with the chase and, you know, oh, there's glue on the, you know, the gas pedal and, 
yeah, so it you know, and and just his reaction, you know, he turns to you know to Bob, not one word, you know, it's just. I love the small clips of police that are clearly useless for the, you know, the, the, what are the mounted police there for? More to the point, why did they send out the speedboats with cops on the board? Are, are they seriously worried that the Blues Brothers might try to escape by sea? You know, and it's just, it's so hilariously ridiculous with that whole thing. And and you have the slowly going up the elevator, you know, with and you're just thinking, oh, they're never gonna make it. You know, they're building the tension and the elevator music, you know, the the girl from Ipanema and you know, and then they actually get to the office and there's a note and the camera switches so we can read the note and it's back in five minutes, and it's just perfect, why not, you know, what else could go wrong? <laughs> and he just shows up, you know, with a half a sandwich in his mouth, half a sandwich in his hand, can I do something for you, and just pick him up, you know, yes, this is tax money now, you know, this is, let's, let's get this done, you know. And what ending could be more perfect to this movie than dance, you know, the, the uh, a prison erupting in dance and joy to the tune of Jailhouse Rock, you know, with the entire Blues Brothers band, you know, <laughs> technically speaking, the band didn't really, you know, what, what were they going to jail for exactly, but whatever, you know, they're there and they're wearing, you know, the prison garb and they're playing against the backdrop of it's never too late to mend, you know, in the background. And you can tell even some of the guards are kind of getting into the music, you know. I suppose that's about what there is to say about the movie. I, I do love the, you know, the utter lack of reaction most of the time from the Blues Brothers. And I like that nobody dies, you know. You don't really see anybody, well, Scratch that. Nearly nobody. The Nazis are probably dead after that. And once again, good riddance. Okay, I'm sorry, but yeah. Other than that, you know, nobody dies. You know, a building is blown up. Eh, yeah, just, you know, dust off your suit and get moving. You know, it's nine o'clock. You gotta get moving. Gotta get to work. And just you know, in general, for all the crashing, no one ever seems hurt. You know, the, the biggest damage that happens is that they broke my watch, you know. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I think that's about it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.